Okay, today we're going to talk about angels. Here you go, if you could take one and pass, pass it around. Oops. All right, angels are not um, transformed humans. <laughs> we, we don't become angels. And the, the kind of secular view of angels being these chubby little babies, uh, you can't find that in scripture anywhere. So uh, if anything, the angels in scripture tend to be a little scary. Um, and that's why every time they appear, they go, don't be afraid. Because <laughs> obviously they're pretty scary looking and, and uh, powerful. So anyway, let's, uh, let's pray before we start. I need to pray. Father, thank you for this day, for your many blessings. Thank you for this opportunity we have to just learn more from your word and more how we can serve you and follow you and know you better. Uh, guide our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, on your outline, uh, pretty simple. Uh, the existence of angels is denied by a lot of people. Even a lot of Christians will say angels are kind of a, a mythological type of thing. Uh, but scripture is pretty plain. Uh, they just assume the existence of angels. Um, Jesus Christ talked about angels. It's all throughout the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. And so I think it's pretty valid to say that angels do exist and we need to understand what their nature is and what, what their purposes are. So Roman numeral two, the nature and appearance of angels. Um, first of all, angels have personality. And remember, I, I tend to summarize personality with intelligence, emotion, and will. And so scripture shows that, that angels have all of those. They have intelligence, they express emotions, and they have a will. Um, <coughs> angels are created beings. Psalm chapter 148 tells us that God created angels. Uh, the question is, when did he create them? Did were angels created when he created light in Genesis 1? Were they created before that? Uh, we really don't know. Later on, we're going to be talking about Satan and his fall. And so that's the big question. When did Satan fall? When did he rebel against God? Um, and how is that related to creation and to us? Uh, obviously, we don't have the timing and all that. Obviously, before the world was created, time was totally different. If there was anything as time, time is something that's confined to this world. Uh, so when we talk about angels maybe being created before the creation of the world, uh, that's, that's, that's more a philosophical statement than it is a time statement. Uh, because before the creation of this world, time was not how we understand it. Uh, when you think about God, there is no before and after. It's just present. And yet, God relates to humankind. He create, relates to creation. So in that sense, there is a before and after. So it's, 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 it's complicated, obviously, and it's, it's hard to understand. But um, many believe that angels were created... Uh, before the world was created, there was a time before that. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with, with, with what's called the gap theory. That's the theory that between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, there was another creation that occurred. Many believe that's when angels were created. And during that time, the angels, uh, Satan and, and the demons, rebelled against God. And so some believe that, that prior to uh, the actual creation of the world that we know today, angels were created. But we, we really have no proof for that. 
Uh, we do know that, that they are created beings. They're not eternal in the same way that God is. Um, they had a beginning, and because they were created, they are creatures. In other words, they, they're in submission to God. They come under God, just as we are. We are creatures. We're not God. There's a real distinction between God and us. And even though we are called to be like God, to be like Jesus, it's not necessarily referring to his being, because we can't be that. We're not God. We're created beings. So angels have personality. They, have, they are spiritual beings. Um, and when we talk about spiritual beings, that's, that's a really broad category, because you can have evil spiritual beings, that's Satan and the demons. We're going to talk about that later. Uh, the Bible talks about unclean spirits. So that would be the same reference to evil spirits. Uh, because they're spiritual beings, they're immaterial. But obviously they show themselves with some kind of body when they appear before humans. But they themselves are spiritual beings, so they're immaterial. Uh, they don't have a physical body as we know it. But obviously when they appear, you, people see something. So there's something there. And, and so in a sense, if, if it's truly spiritual, then you, you can't necessarily see it. Uh, but with the angels, that, they can appear before us. Uh, some have argued about how many angels there are. All we know is uh, there are myriads and myriads, many, many angels. We have no idea how many. And that's why I said angels, angels everywhere, because they are. Um, they have all different kinds of powers, powers that are always under the subjection of God. Angels, the word angel literally means uh, messenger. So that's, that's the primary role of the angel. It's a messenger for God. It's a servant of God. Uh, the angels, do, in a sense, do not have their own agenda uh, to promote. They, they have their, uh, all their orders given to them from God, and they, they are to obey him. Um, names and classifications of angels. This is Roman numeral three. Under appearances, I, th I think we are familiar all throughout Scripture how the angels appear at different times. Um, but it's interesting when you look at the Bible, how many different names <clears throat> are used <clears throat> to refer to these angelic beings. <clears throat> For instance, the word, they're often referred to as stars. They're called sons of the mighty, sons of God. <clears throat> Even the Hebrew word Elohim, which usually has reference to God, is used of angels. Uh, they're called holy ones. Uh, they're called ministers. Uh, they're called chariots. Chariots of God. That's referring to the fact that the angels are kind of like the army of God. They're called God's host, God's army, extension of God's power and providence. We know of two specific angels by name. One is Michael, the archangel. Archangel means the first angel, so he's, he's the first. That you, you get the idea that with angels there is a hierarchy. Uh, what that hierarchy is is not always as plain uh, but there's different classifications of angels. There's cherubim, there's seraphim, there's the mighty hosts. Um, Michael, um, his name means who is like God. He is the archangel. The welfare of the nation of Israel seems to come under his um, power. Daniel chapter 10, it talks about how Michael fights with Satan for control over the nation of Israel. And so, obviously, Michael is, is an important figure. 
Uh, Gabriel, this time of the year, we're especially aware of Gabriel. Gabriel means mighty one of God. He's also considered a messenger. He's the one who came to Mary uh, to announce that she would give birth to Jesus Christ. He was the one that came to Joseph in a dream to say uh, he should go on and marry uh, Mary, Mary, Mary. Um, and so those are the two, only two angels where their names are mentioned. If you're a Mormon, you have a number of other angels that are named. So, and I'm, I'm not as much familiar with that, so I can't go into that. But uh, from the Bible, we only have the two that are named. Okay. Was it uh, Lucifer named? Okay, the good, good point. Um, I'm not including the evil angels right now, but, but you're right. There is one other named angel, and that is... Uh, many believe his, that Lucifer was his name. Okay. But see, there's a lot of confusion on that. And when we talk about Satan, we're going to talk about the different names for Satan and how it, it is both uh, clarifying and confusing at the same time. So, okay. Question, comment? Um, something I, I've read in the book of Revelation that I had been super, been super confused about, uh, and I might be like totally reading this out of context, but like the gatekeeper of like, Okay, yeah, you're right. That, that may be another name for another uh, angel, although many believe that's Satan himself. So that's another name for Satan. So, yeah, see, so it's, yeah. But you, you may have a point there. That may be another angel that is named. Okay. Um, all right, so you have different classifications. This is uh, Roman numeral three. B, classifications, you have the cherubim. Cherubim are considered the highest order of angels. Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel 28, talk about that. Satan was a cherubim, was one of the cherubim. Uh, the cherubim is the one that, you know, when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, it says that a cherubim was put in front of the garden so that no one could come in or come, go out. So the cherubim are, are the highest classification of angels. <clears throat> you have the seraphim, who are, uh, means the burning ones. Isaiah chapter 6 talks about them. Do uh, you remember the vision of Isaiah when he sees into the throne room of heaven? And there's angels there. Remember, the angels have six wings, two to cover their faces, two to cover their feet, and two to fly. So you, you kind of get an image. This is where we got, get the idea that angels have wings. Um, and so uh, the seraphim are the burning ones. They seem to be the ones that surround the throne of God, almost as if they were the, the bodyguards, the bouncers uh, for God. Comment? Or? So if they have like, wings and physical attributes and stuff, how can you say they don't have like, a um, Well, I, th I think we can say they have a spiritual body is the best way to put that. So what, whatever that means... When, when I say they don't have a body, I'm saying you can't, there's nothing physical about them, is the best way to put it. Is that change when they come to Earth? Um, it, it all depends. When, when, you, when you read the accounts of angels, um, it, it's, it's obvious that, that when, when humans would look at angels, they saw something and it looked very physical. But you don't, you don't have much description about, for instance, um, people touching angels or... Yeah, well, and that's a whole other thing. We're going to talk about the, the angel of God because that's the angel of God. So there, there's another angel if you, want, if you want to say there's a name. It's called the angel of God. That's not really a name. That's more a description. So, but we'll talk about that in a moment. But when, when I talk about... How'd that balloon get there? No. It's an angel. Um, so, um, so when we talk about bodies, and, that, and this is the, the hard thing, and, and this is why sometimes, you know, some people believe when we die, our spirit is released from our bodies, and we're, we're basically just these spiritual beings. Well, what does the Bible teach? The Bible teaches resurrection. 
So yeah, when we die before, and it's before the resurrection, there's a lot of different opinions as to what happens to our spirit. But the reality is, the Bible says we're only complete with body and spirit. So we have a resurrected body. Now, what is that resurrected body like? Is it a physical body or is it a spiritual body? Or can it be both? So we know when Jesus rose from the dead, he was able to eat. They could touch his body. They could feel the scars. So there was something physical, but at the same time, he could go through doors. He could just appear. That doesn't sound very physical. So obviously there's something really different going on here. So when we talk about a spiritual body, it doesn't necessarily mean, I, I think, I mean by that that, it's, that the emphasis is more on the fact that it's, a, it's spiritual, not that it's physical. Physical meaning of this earth, something you could touch and feel. Now, obviously Jesus allowed his body to be felt. So you wonder with angels if, if when they appeared before humans, the same thing kind of happened. So we don't, we don't really know that. Um, so we have the cherubim, we have the seraphim, and we have uh, the living creatures from Revelation chapter 4. These living creatures also seem to be ones around the throne of God. Uh, they tend to be the ones who worship God. Uh, and also in Revelation, they direct his judgments. So living creatures is another name for a group of angels. And then you have various angels um, that have specific tasks. You have the messengers of the seven churches of Revelation. The, the actual Greek word is angel. Some believe that's referring to an actual angel. Others believe it's referring to like the pastor or the elder of the church. So we don't, don't really know, but the idea is that there are these seven messengers or angels of the seven churches. Um, the Bible also talks about four angels at the four corners that control the four winds of the earth. So you can see how a lot of this language, some people say, well, that just sounds uh, kind of descriptive or an illustration, not necessarily real. And that's why a lot of people don't believe the reality of angels. They look at all the texts about angels and say that's referring to God dealing with people and how he deals with people. This is how we, how we relate to how God deals with us. But, but to me, there's too many occasions in Scripture that talk about these angels uh, that, that tell me that you, you, you can't just look at this as some kind of figure or illustration, uh, but that they are real. Um, you have the seven angels that stand before God. I've mentioned those, Revelation chapter 8. You have the seven angels who administer uh, the seven last plagues, for instance, in Revelation. Uh, maybe these are the same seven angels. Who knows? And then we have the angel of Jehovah, the angel of God, the angel of Yahweh. Um, many occasions in the Old Testament you have references to that. My personal opinion is that it's a Christophany. Do you know what a Christophany is? That's an appearance of Jesus Christ before he was born. So I believe the angel of the Lord is an appearance of Jesus, the Son of God, uh, before he was born. And the reasons I believe that is because there are occasions in the Old Testament where the angel of God speaks as if he were God. He, there are times where he identifies himself with God. He exercises the prerogatives of God. And you never hear about the appearances of the angel of God after Jesus was born. So that's why I believe that the angel of God refers to um, Jesus Christ as a, as a Christophany, an appearance of Christ before he was born. Okay, he, he, sometimes he, he speaks as if he's speaking as if he is God. So he speaks as God. He, he, there are occasions where he identifies himself with God. He often exercises the prerogatives of God. Genesis chapter 16, Genesis 21, Genesis 22. I think that's 22. 
motives, you mean God's plan? Or yeah, he, or he does certain things that only God can do, kind of. And then, um, uh, as I mentioned, there's no appearances or mention of the, of the angel of God after Jesus is born. So... Okay, we, have, we know that there's angels in heaven from Isaiah chapter 6. But we also get the idea that angels roam around this earth. And when we talk about the fallen angels, Satan and the demons, there are some angels that are bound right now. They're in prison. Some are in prison permanently. Some are in prison temporarily. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But let's look at uh, Roman numeral four, the ministry of angels in relationship to God. Angels praise God. Psalm 148, Isaiah chapter six. Uh, similar to that, they, they uh, worship God. Hebrews chapter one, uh, Romans chapter five, all have references to angels worshiping God. They rejoice at what God does. They serve him. They appear before God, uh, almost in the sense of, of showing honor and majesty towards God. And they're often the instruments of God's judgment. In relation to Jesus Christ, the angels were active at his birth, both in his prediction, in the prediction of his birth, the announcement of his coming um, during the life of Jesus Christ. Angels warned him, they would give direction to him, they would minister to him, they would they were available to come to his defense. I mean, there were a number of times where, where Jesus would say, you know, if I really wanted to, I could call all these angels and they could defeat everybody. The, the account where, where Pilate, or where not Pilate, where, where Judas comes and betrays Jesus. Remember, they're out in the garden. They've been praying. All of a sudden, Jude, Judas comes with all these soldiers, all these temple guards, and he kisses Jesus, points out Jesus. And remember, it was Peter who drew the sword and, uh, struck the one guy, knocked, you know, cut off his ear. And Jesus said to, to Peter, just put your sword away. This isn't the time for this. He said, I could, I could call down all the angels that I wanted to, myriads of angels who could defeat this group here, who could defeat all the Romans in Jerusalem. See? So he had that power. He had that ability to call on the angels. Of course, he never did. Even on the, uh, you know, in, on the cross, the, the, the reality is he could have called on angels to save him, but he didn't. Uh, angels ministered to Jesus after he was tempted. It said that angels came and ministered to him. After his resurrection, it was an angel that, that rolled the stone away. It was an angel that announced to some of the disciples that Jesus had arisen and when Jesus ascended into heaven, it says that angels were there with him. At his second coming, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, um, gives the idea that angels will accompany him, Matthew chapter 25, 2 Thessalonians 1, and angels will be present at the judgment. In relationship to believers, angels help us. Hebrews chapter 1. They communicate and reveal truth to humans. We can find this in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel 8, and also in Revelation chapter 22. It says during the time of the great tribulation, there will be an angel that's just going to be flying over the skies, announcing to people, repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Think about that. And yet people still won't do that. That's what's amazing. 
seen too many movies. What's that? They seen too many well, movies. Well, uh, either that or they're just they just don't want to follow God. I mean, that <laughs> you know, Romans chapter one. That's exactly what it says. That people, even though they know who God is, they know His judgments, uh, do not want to follow Him. That you know, for for those of us who are believers, that's something really hard to grasp and understand. I think so. It's like, well, who wouldn't believe in that? Who wouldn't believe an angel, you know, flying through the heavens and saying, repent and believe? You know, you, you often hear stories of atheists or people who are saying, you know, if they were asked, well, so what, what would ever prove to you that there is a God? And that, what, would it, what would it take for you to really believe in God? And some of, some of the atheists will say, well, nothing. I would never believe in him. See, it's, it's for, for many atheists, it's not a matter of, of trying to convince them and say, hey, God does exist. It's, it's a rebellion of the heart against God. And, and of course, as believers, that's what the grace of God has done to us. It's changed us so that we don't look at God in that way. We look at God in, in, as our savior, as our deliverer, as our rescuer, as the one who loves us not as somebody who wants to confine us or restrict us. And that's why a lot of people reject uh, following God. They don't want that restriction or what they think is a restriction. What they don't realize is they're under the slavery of sin, <laughs> which is a worse slavery. So. so anyway, in relationship to believers, he helps us. Uh, they communicate. Um, Acts chapter 12 implies that they sometimes are the answer to our prayers. Uh, that's the incident, I think, where, where Peter's in prison. The disciples are praying for him, and the angel comes and actually leads him out of that prison. In fact, Peter says at first, I, I thought it was a dream. Then all of a sudden, I'm outside. Um, and then even, even when he appears to the, at the door where the disciples are, remember the... Uh, Rhoda, the, the maid, came to the door. She sees Peter, and she's so excited. She doesn't even open the door for him. She goes back to the disciples, and she says, Hey, he's here, he's here. And, and you know, here they've been praying for his release, and they go, Oh, you got to be crazy. It must be his angel. So it shows you how much faith they had in their prayers, <laughs> rather than saying, Oh, yeah, we just prayed for him, so of course he's released. No, that's, that's how we are when we pray. Just because just we pray doesn't mean we have a lot of faith. We, we know we need to pray, and actually our prayers sometimes show our lack of faith and how much we, we need to trust in God. So, um, so not only was an angel the one who delivered Peter, but to Rhoda, you know, they said, well, it's his angel. So that's probably where we get the idea that humans become angels and things like that. In other words, they're saying that, that what you saw, Rhoda, was not actually Peter. You saw a spiritual being that looked like Peter. So that's, that's kind of what they were saying. Um, Acts chapter 8 and 10 and Luke 15 um, shows that angels are, are involved in our salvation. I like especially Luke chapter 15. That's where you have the, uh, the three stories that Jesus gives, the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the, and the prodigal son. And remember, uh, he said, when, when uh, one sinner repents, uh, the angels of heaven rejoice. Isn't that amazing? So look, think back, and when you first trusted Christ, when you became a Christian, there was a big party in heaven just for you. And you're probably thinking, well, how come I wasn't invited to it? Well, <laughs> you were just the cause of it, okay? So anyway, angels rejoice when, when a, a sinner repents. Um, and the Bible also says that the angels often observe humans and they learn from us. And what they learn, I believe, is primarily the whole aspect of salvation. I do not believe Jesus died for the angels. Okay, he died for mankind. So the salvation the angels have is, is, in a sense, is not contingent on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ as it is for us. It's a salvation that occurred, I believe, before the creation of the world, when, 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 um, <clears throat> when Satan fell, obviously 
the angels were all perfect, but he fell, took a third of the angels with him. But at that point, I believe their, their salvation, in a sense, was secured. <clears throat> so angels observe um, humans. They encourage us, Acts chapter 27. And Luke chapter 16 implies that angels are present at our death. And that's the, I think that's the story of um, Lazarus and the rich man. Talks about how the angels escorted Lazarus into the bosom of Abraham. Go ahead. Do you think angels are created in the image of God? Um, my, my gut feeling is to say no, because there's nothing that says that. So, and I agree, but follow-up question quick. Yeah. So, obviously, Scripture, I don't think, says it because Scripture is designed for humanity. Um, but that being said, in Scripture, we can observe a lot of the uh, characteristics of angels. So, like, mm-hmm. superior intellect, ability, such as reason and abstract thought, worship of God, language and communication with God, ability to make decisions, creative expression, immorality, emotions such as love, joy, desire, sadness, pride, anger, things like that, which are all characteristics that come from free will. Mm-hmm. It also speaks to the image in which we were created. Okay, you're, you're putting a lot of emphasis when you talk about image of God on will, free will, right? Everything. Yeah, that's one of the Okay, of yeah, because to me, the, and we'll, we'll get this when we study anthropology, when we talk about the, the um, made in the image of God. Um, but yeah, angels have will. That, that's part of their personality. So they have, in a sense, an ability to choose, make decisions. Um, so yeah, so what are you, what are you trying to say? Or well, I was just curious, so is that, does that come into the um, aspect of it looks like they probably are made in the image of God, like, like it relates to humanity? Well, I, 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 I guess, I, I guess uh, my response, uh, initial response would be, well, since God is the one who created angels and, and he created them as beings, then yes, there's going to be a connection between them and God himself. Uh, but, but since the Bible doesn't specifically say they're created in the image of God, to me that's, that's a term that I reserve for humanity. Okay, And obviously there's going to be characteristics in angels that are similar to God and therefore similar to us and all that kind of stuff. But, but I think the actual idea of being created in the image of God is, is a very specific designation for humanity. And, and we'll be talking about that when we get into anthropology. Okay. On that, could you say like, that if the angels are learning about us, they could take upon form as us? Well, I, I don't know if I'd say they're learning as much as they're observing. Okay. Uh, it, 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 it's more they, the, the scripture passages say they observe. And, and I think what the, I believe what that's referring to is they, they observe things because they cannot relate to it. They cannot relate to salvation in the same way that we can relate to it. And so that's, that's they see that and they see that that's different. See, I, I guess is how I would describe it. Yeah. I don't think they can now. I think there was a time where they could have. That's why Satan fell. So I, I, my, I believe that Satan <clears throat> fell, and if he fell, that means he had a will to disobey God. He was able to disobey God. Um, and I, I therefore believe that all the angels, at least at one time, could have. Whether they can now, that, that is actually a, a, a question that, that, that there are differences in answer. Some people believe that in the end, even Satan will be saved. Now, I, I don't believe you can get that from the Bible you, it, unless you, you kind of make the assumption that, that of, of universalism that eventually God saves everybody, including <coughs> Satan. And it's not, it's not, this isn't just a modern thought. Uh, Origen, who was one of the uh, early church fathers, he believed that Satan would be saved. Uh, because he believed that, though, he was excommunicated. I mean, he was, he was kicked out. 
of the church, basically. He was, he was branded a heretic. But there was another church father who thought, he said, well, I don't, I don't know for sure if Satan will be saved, but it sure would be nice if he would be. And that guy was not excommunicated. So there's, there's these varying degrees of, of how people look at um, salvation, uh, how people are saved, who are saved, when they're able to be saved, and so on. And, but I, I tend to believe that right now angels are set in their path. They, the, we have the fallen angels. We have the, the, um, what's often called the elect angels, and, the, and they're set. They, they can't transfer over. And, and you get the impression in, in Revelation, um, you know, it says that hell was designed for the angels and the demons. And that's where they're going to end up. See. Okay. Um, do you think there's a set number of them? Or are they like no, I think there's a set number, and partly because the one passage where uh, Jesus was arguing with the Sadducees, and they, you know, they gave the story about the guy who, or the, the gal who married the one uh, uh, guy, and then um, he died, she married the brother, and the next brother, and so married seven brothers. And then, of course, their question was, who's, who's she going to be married to in eternity? And, of course, they didn't even believe in, e in heaven, in eternity. So you, you, they're trying to trick Jesus. But remember, his answer was, well, in heaven, you just don't understand. In heaven, there, there's no giving in marriage like the angels. So I, I don't think the angels are multiplying. I'm not sure the angels ever multiplied. I think that, that when God created the angels, that was the set number that there was when he created them and it's never changed. Now, you do have the story in Genesis chapter six about the son of, sons of God who came down and cohabitated with uh, uh, women and Nephilim were created. Uh, that's a whole nother category. Uh, but many believe that, that were actually, those were actually demons that came down, took on human form and had intercourse with, with women. See, others believe it's just a reference to the, the evil line <laughs> um, of, you know, after creation. So, but yeah, I don't, I don't think the, the angels are multiplying or growing. So, one more question. This is kind of random, and I don't know how important it is, but I was just wondering, is there female angels? Good point. Um, I don't. In Scripture, there's no reference to that. And, and you might even, you, you know, you could make the point, well, maybe angels are genderless. Yeah. Um, but there are references when they refer to angels, they often use a, a male son pronoun. Or yeah, or like the son, the, the, angel, the, the, the angel of God is, is often referred to in, in male terms. Well, that's, that's a good point, too. So maybe all, all angels are men. So it's, it's a chauvinistic uh, group of people. <laughs> there's, there's a glass ceiling you women can maybe... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's right. You don't become angels. Sorry. None of you are angels. Sorry. No. All right. Time's up. Thank you. I think you've got Philemon or something coming up. Okay.